How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie Part 3, Chapter 11 The movies do it. TV does it. Why don't you do it? Many years ago, the Philadelphia Evening Bulletin was being maligned by a dangerous whispering campaign. A malicious rumor was being circulated. Advertisers were being told that the newspaper was no longer attractive to readers because it carried too much advertising and too little news. Immediate action was necessary. The gossip had to be squelched. But how? This is the way it was done. The bulletin clipped from its regular edition all reading matter of all kinds on one average day, classified it, and published it as a book. The book was called One Day. It contained 307 pages as many as a hardcover book. Yet the bulletin had printed all this news and feature material on one day and sold it. Not for several dollars, but for a few cents. The printing of that book dramatized the fact that bulletin carried an enormous amount of interesting reading matter. It conveyed the facts more vividly, more interestingly, more impressively, than pages of figures and mere talk could have done. This is the day of dramatization. Merely stating the truth isn't enough. The truth has to be made vivid, interesting, dramatic. You have to use showmanship. The movies do it. Television does it. And you will have to do it if you want attention. Experts in window display know the power of dramatization. For example, the manufacturers of a new rat poison gave dealers a window display that included two live rats. The week the rats were shown, sales zoomed to five times their normal rate. Television commercials abound with examples of the use of dramatic techniques in selling products. Sit down one evening in front of your television set and analyze what the advertisers do in each of their presentations. You will note how an antacid medicine changes the color of the acid in a test tube, while its competitor doesn't. How one brand of soap or detergent gets a greasy shirt clean, while the other brand leaves it gray. You'll see a car maneuver around a series of turns and curves, far better than just being told about it. Happy faces will show contentment with a variety of products. All of these dramatize for the viewer the advantages offered by whatever is being sold, and they do get people to buy them. You can dramatize your ideas in business or in any other aspect of your life. It's easy. Jim Yeemans, who sells for the NCR company, National Cash Register, in Richmond, Virginia, told how he made a sale by dramatic demonstration. Last week, I called on a neighborhood grocer and saw that the cash registers he was using at his checkout counters were very old-fashioned. I approached the owner and told him, you are literally throwing away pennies every time a customer goes through your line. With that, I threw a handful of pennies on the floor. He quickly became more attentive. The mere words should have been of interest to him, but the sound of pennies hitting the floor really stopped him. I was able to get an order from him to replace all of his old machines. It works in home life as well. When the old-time lover proposed to his sweetheart, did he just use words of love? No, he went down on his knees. That really showed he meant what he said. We don't propose on our knees anymore, but many suitors still set up a romantic atmosphere before they pop the question. Dramatizing what you want works with children as well. Joe B. Fant Jr. of Birmingham, Alabama was having difficulty getting his five-year-old boy and three-year-old daughter to pick up their toys. So he invented a train. Joey was the engineer, Captain Casey Jones, on his tricycle. Janet's wagon was attached, and in the evening, she loaded all the coal on the caboose, her wagon, and then jumped in while her brother drove her around the room. In this way, the room was cleaned up, without lectures, arguments, or threats. Mary Catherine Wolfe of Mishawaka, Indiana, 
was having some problems at work and decided that she had to discuss them with the boss. On Monday morning, she requested an appointment with him, but was told he was very busy and she should arrange with the secretary for an appointment later in the week. The secretary indicated that his schedule was very tight, but she would try to fit her in. Miss Wolf described what happened. I did not get a reply from her all week long. Whenever I questioned her, she would give me a reason why the boss could not see me. Friday morning came, and I had heard nothing definite. I really wanted to see him and discuss my problems before the weekend, so I asked myself how I could get him to see me. What I finally did was this. I wrote him a formal letter. I indicated in the letter that I fully understood how extremely busy he was all week, but it was important that I speak with him. I enclosed a form letter and a self-addressed envelope and asked him to please fill it out or ask his secretary to do it and return it to me. The form letter read as follow. Miss Wolf, I will be able to see you on blank at blank. I will give you blank minutes of my time. I put this letter in his in basket at 11 a.m. at 2 p.m. I checked my mailbox. There was my self-addressed envelope. He had answered my form letter himself and indicated he could see me that afternoon and could give me 10 minutes of his time. I met with him and we talked for over an hour and resolved my problems. If I had not dramatized to him that the fact that I really wanted to see him, I would probably be still waiting for an appointment. James B. Boynton, had to present a lengthy market report. His firm had just finished an exhaustive study for a leading brand of cold cream. Data were needed immediately about the competition in this market. The prospective customer was one of the biggest and most formidable men in the advertising business. And his first approach failed almost before he began. The first time I went in, Mr. Boynton explains, I found myself sidetracked into a futile discussion of the methods used in the investigation. He argued and I argued. He told me I was wrong and I tried to prove that I was right. I finally won my point to my own satisfaction, but my time was up. The interview was over and I still hadn't produced results. The second time, I didn't bother with tabulations of figures and data. I went to see this man. I dramatized my facts. Isaac entered his office. He was busy on the phone. While he finished his conversation, I opened a suitcase and dumped 32 jars of cold cream on top of his desk. All products he knew. All competitors of his cream. On each jar, I had a tag itemizing the results of the trade investigation. And each tag told its story briefly, dramatically. What happened? There was no longer an argument. Here was something new, something different. He picked up the first one and then another of the jars of cold cream and read the information on the tag. A friendly conversation developed. He asked additional questions. He was intensely interested. He had originally given me only 10 minutes to present my facts, but 10 minutes passed. 20 minutes, 40 minutes, and at the end of an hour, we were still talking. I was presenting the same facts this time that I had presented previously, but this time I was using dramatization, showmanship, and what a difference it made. Principle 11. Dramatize your ideas.